After its 1962 Plymouth and Dodge lineup failed in the marketplace, Chrysler decided to part ways with its then styling chief, Virgil Exner. Exner had executed some of the best looking Chryslers of, well, all time, including in particular the 1957 lineup that sported his new forward look and set many of the other auto companies back on their heels, in particular General Motors, when it was introduced. But Exner's 1962 designs really just didn't cut it, and Chrysler needed to go in a new direction. Thus, they poached an individual who was responsible for arguably one of the most seminal designs of the era, the 1961 Continental, and that individual was named Elwood Engel, and he came from Ford. When Chrysler poached Engel, he was in his mid-40s, and upon arrival, he really didn't have much time to do anything to the 1963 lineup aside from tone some of the elements that Exner put on the vehicles down a bit, perhaps best characterized by the more conventional 1963 Imperial. If you take a look at the back here, you can see it's more conventional than the previous 1962 design. But for 1964, Engel would get his chance at designing an all-new luxury car, the Imperial by Chrysler. At this point, the Imperial really needed a redo. It was supposed to have been refreshed for the 1962 model year, but due to capital constraints, Chrysler pushed off the redesign to the 1964 model year. And in some cases, the clay model proposals that were destined to be the Imperials were actually made into Chrysler's for the 1963 model year because Chrysler felt that it needed something newer in that area of the lineup faster than it needed a new Imperial. Regardless, to say that the 1964 Imperial that made it into the marketplace looked a bit like the 1961 Continental, is perhaps a bit of an understatement. It's really a new interpretation of a similar theme with very sheer sides and clean body sections. And it mimicked, in many ways, that 1961 Continental that Engel was so famous for, and that's likely what Chrysler management wanted, hence why they poached him. Aside from the tall and clean body side sections on the 64 Imperial, it also had another characteristic Lincoln trade, and that was this faux spare tire trunk hump that was really borrowed from the 1956 Continental Mark II. For whatever reason, Engel decided to adopt it to the Imperial, and I think it looks relatively tasteful out back. And one could also make an argument that Engel poached a styling theme from another Ford for the C-Pillars, that of the Thunderbird, with this very chunky, somewhat upright, forward roof-lined C-Pillar. Because the body side sections were so clean and really unadorned, the vehicle didn't have much sense of motion conveyed by its overall surfacing, and so every surface on the vehicle was canted a bit and slanted forward to give the car a bit of a look of motion. You see this in the front fenders as well as the rear quarter panel, those tips, and the roof pillar. And while one could argue that this 64 Imperial had quite a bit of inspiration from the Ford side of the family, at least the grill did have some true imperial heritage, with the split grill theme coming from the 1955 to 56 imperials that introduced the imperial as its own mark. It certainly was a less prominent front end, the 1961 to 63 imperial that had those super kooky freestanding headlamp pods, but it was tasteful and the headlights here had more of a floating theme in the grill, and I think, like I said, it looked overall quite handsome. But one of the great things about the 64 Imperial was not just its exterior styling, but really the interior styling set a new direction for Imperial at this time frame. Recall that the 61 to 63 Imperials had a very strange, funky looking dash with the squircle steering wheel and an instrument panel pod that kind of had, I guess you'd call them miniature fins where the climate control panel and the turn signal indicators were residing, as well as the push buttons for Chrysler's Torque Flight Automatic. This was more of a driver-centric cockpit, if you could call it that. It wasn't rotated around the driver, but it certainly had a driver's section to it. And for 1964, Engel changed that styling direction to really have one continuous instrument panel from the driver all the way through to the passenger. And this would be a theme that would continue on the Imperials all the way through to the end. Well, if you exclude the 1981 to 83 Imperial and the front wheel drive Imperial that came after that. In any case, this extremely mid-century modern design for the 64 Imperial, I think is just, again, very tasteful and handsome and 
relatively modest, I would say, though very, very nicely trimmed. It also resembled a bit of another vehicle on the inside, and can you guess what it is? Ding, 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 the 64 Continental. But this instrument panel was just a beautiful, full-width, constant section design that Engel and his team penned, and there were some great details, as I mentioned, associated with it. There was this long, narrow, rolling drum-style speedometer that was made popular by some other vehicles at the time, but again, quite tasteful, and it was set above all of these different gauges that allowed you to see what was happening with the engine and the vehicle overall. Take a look here at the driver's side of the instrument panel for the 1964 Imperial, and you see the controls for the push-button torque flight transmission. This was really the end of this push-button style engagement for the torque flight. Chrysler had tried to push this on consumers, and they ended up not really liking it. I think it was just harder to affect your gear changes with this than to just move a column shifter up or down. And for the 1965 model year, these push buttons would disappear and Chrysler would indeed just switch to a column mounted transmission shift selector. You also notice there that you have the gasoline temperature gauge, high beam indicator, and controls for the lights as well as the mirror and the wiper on the driver's side of the instrument panel pod. And over on the passenger side, you had the HVAC controls. You can see there, this car is an air conditioning equipped vehicle with maximum cooling, in other words, recirculation, fresh cooling, defrost as well as heat and the temperature bar slider. You'll notice the oil pressure indicator and alternator gauge are also there. So Imperial did give you a nice set of full gauges, which in later years would continue to be a unique feature of the Imperial, even after other domestics went to mostly idiot lights. This is a convertible, so you can see the control for the convertible top there, moving it up and down. Autopilot, which is not the Tesla autopilot feature, but that was Chrysler's name for a cruise control in this era, and that cruise control setup was actually pretty common on a number of vehicles in the coming years. That would be made by the Perfect Circle Corporation, which I believe was later bought by Dana, but it was a pretty good cruise control system overall. And here's another look, just taking a step back at the Imperial interior, and this is a crown version, the lower end. This is in a crown convertible, and the LeBaron would have been the top end Imperial, and that was only available in four-door hardtop body style. So if you got a convertible or a two-door, you had to get the crown. And you can see here the push buttons on the left, as I mentioned. And also Imperial introduced a new steering wheel for 1964, this two-spoke design with big horn rings that you could push on the top and the bottom. The squircle steering wheel of the 1961 to 63 Imperial was clearly gone in this case. And if a buyer opted for the top of the line Imperial LeBaron, or as I like to call it, the LeBaron, then the buyer got not only all those cool features in that styling, but also real walnut veneer on the interior. You can see it here on the door panel. And irrespective of what Imperial that you got, Chrysler's attention to detail was just amazing. There was no plastic in these interiors aside from elements of the steering wheel. Everything was really die cast metal all the door handles, the switches, the door pulls, and they really did a nice job with the lighting. You can see here that there are lights incorporated into the door handles that would illuminate the door panel, and not quite visible here, but this Imperial also had pockets in the doors. You could flip up and then put whatever you wanted in there, maps, etc. It was an overall nice touch that would continue on the Imperials for years, which I believe Ford would actually steal back on some Lincolns in later years. And I think that if you sit in one of these Imperials, you'll just feel the attention to detail and quality. It's unfortunate that Imperial by this point had lost its own assembly plant. But still, there was quite a bit of attention to detail in this 1964 Imperial. And there were, by Chrysler's admission, three separate corps of inspectors that looked at the Imperial and evaluated 1,650 quality control elements associated with it. And while these Imperials are really great cars, and I will say I believe that these are the Imperials that got outlawed from demo derbies, or at least got the Imperial outlawed from them, if you ever have a chance to look underneath at the frame of these Imperials, particularly in the front under the bumper, oh my goodness, the most rigidly reinforced frames that I have ever seen on any vehicle. Here's a picture of what it looks like, and yeah, you can imagine this would do well in the demo derbies. In any case, these cars unfortunately really didn't sell all that well for Imperial. 1964 was the best model year sales-wise, 
where 23,295 were sold, of which 20,300-ish were crowns, and the remainder, about 2,900, were Le Barons. So the Le Baron really wasn't all that popular, as I mentioned. It was just offered in the hardtop four-door sedan form. 1965 sales would further taper off down to 18,400, and in 1966, sales would taper off yet again to just 13,700 units. So this generation of Imperial is quite rare, but I think it's a very special one inside and out, and particularly I think that the tasteful direction that Chrysler set with the interior was just a great step forward. In any case, hope you enjoyed the spotlight on the 1964 Imperial and its interior. If you did, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and check out the video thumbnails at bottom left and right for some suggestions for you.